Does it say live on your end? Yes, it does. Perfect. And we are live. So we can give it uh, we can give it another 30 seconds or so just to see if anyone <laughs> jumped on. Okay. Well, I know somebody was going to try to. Somebody from work. Nice. Yeah, I knew a couple of people that were going to try to jump on too. So, um, Great. Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple of people from Blue Cross said they were going to join. So. Oh, good. Good. All right, we have a couple of viewers. So just uh, everyone that's jumping on, we're just waiting a couple seconds for people to join. Um, but we'll start. We'll start in a minute here. And meanwhile, uh, you can enjoy the background in this small apartment right here, <laughs> <laughs> or the main the main office where I do these interviews. <laughs> there you go. All I right. like that better. Yeah, exactly. So we can go ahead and we can go ahead and get started here. Um, so first of all, Audrey, thank you for joining. Sure, uh, my pleasure. To remind everyone, kind of the the goal of these interviews is uh, I'm kind of going through and interviewing people in various STEM professions, but mostly actuarial. Um, as uh, you know, I'm an actuary myself. Uh, Audrey is an actuary as well, and um, so I'm going to be kind of getting her insights on kind of her career. Uh, different thoughts that she has on the career. And this is really to help people either that are getting into the career or even people that are experienced and have been in the profession for a while. I think you should find it interesting. Um, and if you have any questions along the way, feel free to comment. I think down below or somewhere on the side, there's a way to uh, comment in YouTube. So, um, so again, thank you, Audrey, for joining. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so my first question for you, uh, before we dive into uh, your career is when did you first hear about uh, the actuarial profession? I believe you told me before it was kind of in the family. Yes, it was in the family. So maybe it was when I was in the crib because my wow. father, <laughs> <laughs> my father is an actuary. He's, he passed away now, but he was an actuary back in probably 1951. And he got his, um, uh, uh, I think he got his fellowship in the Society of Actuaries in 55 or 56. And um, <clears throat> so uh, I've known, he was actually a charter member of the American Academy of Actuaries when they started in 1965. Oh, wow. I, I have his, his cert certification, so it's pretty cool to see that. He was also the president of the Society of Actuaries in 1978 to 79 and president of the American Academy of Actuaries in 1981 to 82. So wow. back when I was probably 12 or so, I asked my dad this. OK, so this is like last century, a long, long time ago. I said, Dad, do you make about fifty thousand dollars a year? And he chuckled <laughs> and she goes and he said, yes, dear. And so ever since then, I figured I'd want to be an actuary because uh, they make good money. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so I made my decision at when I was 12. Wow. I, I think, honestly, that is the youngest age I've ever heard of someone <laughs> wanting to be an actuary. <laughs> well, I used to love math. I'd get in... Um, in conversations with one of my girlfriends in third grade, we argued about whether zero was a number. And <laughs> she said, yes, it was. And I said, no, it wasn't. Um, and of course, she became a chief technology officer uh, for a company. And so, yeah, she she got into the um, technology field. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and so where, where zero is a very important number. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's a good point. That's right. So it's been a long time since I've been interested in math. That's awesome. So it kind of uh, ran in the family then. Did, it did. Like, so from a young age, were you just like, you always liked math, you were always good at it? Or like, was it kind of your dad telling you about that, that kind of got you into math classes? No, it was before then that I was interested in math. I really okay. liked math and, and science, too. I was the first female in my high school my senior year to win the science award. Wow, congrats. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, way. Again, last century. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. 
So in school then, did you end up majoring in math or it was actuarial science, oh, I believe, right? It was actuarial science, but it was through the business school at the University of Wisconsin. So it wasn't through oh. the math department, um, which I think is a better approach because you have to have a little bit more broader education and having to take speaking courses and writing courses and things like that and not quite so much theoretical math. And uh, so I think it was a good setup for me because I mean, actuarial science is a business so you, when you actually start practicing and it's a business. So it was really, really a good background, I thought, through the business school. Yeah, that's actually, a, that brings me to a topic I was going to ask you about later, but I'm going to ask you now is, okay. uh, I feel like there's so many skills involved in actuarial. And um, I mean, a lot of people, including myself, before I got into the profession, I thought, you know, this is just going to be a bunch of like mathematical formulas and I'll just yeah. be sitting crunching numbers the whole time. Can you kind of speak to that and the, the skills maybe that you learned in writing and speaking that have helped you? Oh, yeah. Well, um, part of my career I spent as a consultant and um, you're doing projects for clients all the time. And writing is extremely key because you have to make sure that it's very clear and that you don't leave anything to the reader's guessing. So, for yeah. example, um, we it was always up and left. Say this is attached is the thing that you asked for the tangible thing and this is how you're going to use it because those two things are key and if you don't have that if somebody just says do make create a, a cost model for me well how are you going to use it because i can't just create right. a cost model unless i know what you're using it for so as part of the writing you have those two things um and then it's interesting because a lot of times when people write if I'm reading it and editing it, I edit with a green pen so it looks like Vulcan blood rather than red blood. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier on the eyes. I like that approach. <laughs> but um, they, they'll leave a lot of guesswork in the writing. And so you have to, you cannot say this is a reasonable answer. You have to say this is a reasonable answer because. Because if you just say it's reasonable, then people are going to say, well, why? And so understanding how to be clear in writing is extremely helpful for actuaries when they're dealing with non-technical people That's and technical people too. Yeah, that is a very good point. I mean, I mean, I found the same thing for myself as well. And I think that uh, like, obviously you need the mathematical ability, but the people that I've seen that are really successful are the ones who know how to communicate. <laughs> Right, right. And then speaking, too, is um, is a, a talent. It's it's really um, just because, you know, math doesn't mean that you're going to be able to speak well. You know, you need to be able to get your point across in an interesting manner with the least amount of words so that then there's time for questions, because I, I also believe that the only stupid question is the one that isn't asked. <laughs> because and, yeah. yeah so so um getting making it interesting for for the audience is really really important and you got to know your audience because your audience of if you're going to I'm speaking next week at the society of actuaries meetings in two sessions and that audience is a bunch of actuaries so what you do for them is very different than what you would do for a board of directors. Is, is this the uh, health meeting in Austin? Yes. Oh, I'm yes, gonna be there. Is. Oh, awesome, yeah. awesome. You should come to the, the professionalism session on the ASOP updates because we're gonna be playing I'll a game. That. Okay, it nice. Sounds I'm really gonna... boring, but we're gonna play a game. <laughs> nice, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, so making it interesting for people is something that I always try to do. I, you know, throw out questions. I don't just read the words on the bullets and the, you know, on a slide show or something like that. But um, if your, your audience is a board of directors or even your executives that are non actuarial, you just really need to break it down to the key points and, and speak to it fairly quickly. And then if you have, if you're doing this for your boss and they want to ask questions, 
-hmm. Let them ask the questions. You don't have to lay it totally out. Let them ask the questions and go as deep as they want to. So really understanding the audience is key for both the writing as well as um, the speaking. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I worked uh, for Augury for a while when I was at Blue Cross. And uh, I, I noticed that you were a really good communicator, really good speaker. And I think that's why you've been so successful or one of the reasons you've been so successful in your career. Do you feel like, um, I mean, you kind of hinted at it with your program in school. Do you feel like you developed some of those skills back then or has it really been kind of the whole course of your career that's uh, oh. on that? The whole course of my career. I used to be my first job out of college. I worked for the Hartford Insurance Group and I would be terrified to call somebody and ask for something. And so I would I would write it out and, you know, so make sure that I had everything yeah. ready to ask. And I mean, that was I never thought I would be that way. And that was just in the work environment. Never had a work environment like that before coming out right out of college. But um, so when I started going to conferences, actuarial conferences, I made myself ask at least one question every time. That's good. Because then I would have to stand up in the audience and then people would look at me and they'd probably question whether I had a stupid question or not. But, you know, a lot of times people said, yeah, that's I, I wanted to know that. So um, I realized it wasn't stupid. And <laughs> yep. like I said, the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. And um, so I just got really used to to speaking up and speaking out and um, uh, but it took a lot of practice. Yeah, that's I mean, that's good to hear because I can say in my own experience, I remember my first job, I was I was actually terrified to pick up the phone and call someone. I and which was weird because like I wasn't really used to that because I've yeah. you know, I thought that I was okay on the phone or around people, but I think it was just suddenly being in that professional setting. Right. I like was like, I don't know what I'm gonna ask this person, but I'm supposed to call them and so it it's uh I think that's maybe a normal thing for, for any of you who are new to the profession, yeah. uh, practice makes perfect, so. Yeah, but one of the things that I've found um, uh, the, the higher up in my career that I got, that if you treat everybody with respect and as if they had is just as important of a job as you have, then you get along really well and um, and you'll get whatever you want or whatever you need and you ha also help them. So yeah. the, the treating with respect, we're all adults, right? I mean, we exactly. graduated from college, we're taking yes. exams. If you treat everybody with respect, everybody, because you all have a, a place in the boat and we're trying to all go in the same direction. And so let's, let's work it together. Um, my role is different from your role is different from your administrative assistance role, but you can't do it without everybody. So right. um, treating people respect with respect is I think a huge opportunity from the day you walk into work to the day you leave work, which yeah. I'm going to do pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. That is exciting. When that's coming in a month, right? Yep. Less than a month. Yep. That is very exciting. Um, I, I wasn't sure if it, you had announced it or whatever, so I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Audrey is retiring, so. Yay. That is exciting. Um, yeah, I like what you're saying about treating people with respect. I feel like, um, that. I mean, that, that really goes a long way. I mean, it, it makes it easier to work with people, yeah. uh, all sorts of things. So uh, I, I totally agree with that. But uh, Yeah. Oh, I had I have um, two examples. One, my the the best boss I ever had, Bill Thompson in the Milliman office of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, he and he and I would work together, and we'd brainstorm on a whiteboard, and we'd we'd be trying to solve a solution together and he would listen to me and then we would argue about it and then we would get the best answer. And he was my boss and he'd had, he had years of experience on me. And at that point I realized, wow, this is really fun when you can actually yeah. work together to brainstorm and use your, what you've learned as well as your insights 
together is just awesome. And then I had a boss who said, the first week I worked for him, he said, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And so I'm going to have to destroy your self-confidence. <laughs> and he did. And, and <laughs> it took a few months before I just yelled at him because he was just really difficult to work with. Wow. So um, he was nice to me after I yelled at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So that approach worked? <laughs> <laughs> for him only. That's the only time that ever happened. <laughs> But um, so, you know, being a good boss and working for a good boss are so important for, you know, for people to be thinking about is what kind of boss do you want to be? Right. And if you love to use your brain and work together to resolve and solve problems, then, you know, just be nice to everybody. <laughs> yeah. That's a good approach. That's, that makes it simple. <clears throat> So when you were uh, when you were in school, <laughs> did you are you all right? Yes. <clears throat> Wrong pipe. I know. I'm like I'm drinking my coffee over here, my tea. <laughs> I'm good. <clears throat> okay. Um. So I was gonna ask, like, when you were in school, did you have any internships? I I wanted to ask just because you know we're in the summer <clears throat> right now. There's a lot of people that are getting internships or they they have internships yeah. right now. <clears throat> um. If so, did that help you uh, in your career later on? <clears throat> yes, I think it did. <clears throat> I had two exams by the time I graduated from college. <clears throat> I had material through number five, but I only passed two. But then <clears throat> in the summer, I worked for CUNA Mutual Insurance Society in Madison, Wisconsin, same town as the school. And I think having that on my resume was awesome. Um, that and having the two exams really was helped me to get a job. <clears throat> of course, back in the last century, <laughs> although it was a recession. I, I realize that now. I didn't know oh, it wow. then, but it was a recession. But um, I, I traveled all over the country with, where the, the companies would come onto the campus and do an interview and then they would invite you if they wanted you um, to travel and so I traveled all over the country from LA to Boston you know and <clears throat> had job offers all over the place and I think that That's that awesome. internship although I I learned that I didn't really like um, to work with Fortran <laughs> That I might have, set my age. <laughs> I have never programmed in Fortran. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, but I and I, I was working for a casualty insurance company and in, working on workers' comp. But I ended up going into a company that was I was working on the life insurance side. So um, I don't think that the the actual work that I did there helped me get the job. But just having the internship on my resume did so i encourage everybody to get do an internship if they can no I, I believe that um so you you had that internship and that probably opened a lot of doors for you your first what was like after school and after the internship uh where where was your first job at my first job was in hartford connecticut so i i graduated from the university of wisconsin madison <clears throat> so moved to, to the insurance capital <laughs> I went to the insurance capital of the world, absolutely, and it was um, it was very competitive for actuaries there. So if you didn't pass your exams, um, you could be out of a job. See, I've heard about this. I've heard I've never been at a company like that, but I've heard you could be fired if you didn't pass after a certain number of tries. Yep, that was that was um, at the Hartford, and I think that was um, Travelers was a big company there at, the, at that time too. So um, that was sort of the deal. Wow. So did you uh, you pass your exams and didn't get fired? I, <laughs> I did. I did pass my exams, and I was not fired. I went to Milliman after about um, a year and three quarters. Okay. So. So give the audience an idea of, we'll, we'll get to uh, your life more present in your career in a little bit, but back then, what, what did your daily life look like in terms of, um, were it, like what was the office setting like? Were you in a cubicle? Did you have breaks? Um, did you have lunch breaks? Was it really busy? 
there were no such things as cubicles back All in right. the last century. <laughs> <laughs> so we just had desks on an open floor. And so you could be either sitting right next to des desks like this, two of them, and then two in the front. So they were sort of set up almost like um, school chairs. You know, okay. if you think back to, to high school and you all had your yes. own little chair yes. and they were all in rows, well, that's sort of the way it was, um, uh, but not quite so many. There was more space and things like that, but it was just a desk and it was a pretty big desk. And uh, But I had somebody sitting right next to me and then it was open and then there were two more in front of me. So um, <clears throat> we did have... Um, when I was an intern, they had a 10 minute break in the morning and a 10 minute break in the afternoon, along with a lunch break. Uh, I, don't I don't remember the 10 minute break in the morning and afternoon at um, my first jo real job out of college, but um, they did have a lunch break and I think it was a half an hour. Okay. So they had, they had um, cafeterias on site or you could bring your own stuff in and they all lots of free coffee that's important keep you going yeah yeah so but then you, we also did you get much study time too or um i got i i did get study time um my first position was working in a financial reporting area and <clears throat> that was extremely busy so it was high paced you did the reserves, you did the expense analysis, then you projected the reserves for the next month, and then you did the actual reserves for the next month, and then you did the expense analysis. So it was just, it was always high, very, very high paced. Wow. Year end financial statements were, were really, really busy. And then the budget time, the financial projections for the upcoming year, that was all big. So I would go and get my study time, but then my boss would come in and interrupt me. Oh, that makes it terrible. <laughs> so I never got my study time in that first position. And then in the second position I had, they rotated me after about a year and a half. Okay. They put me in the air, this area where <clears throat> people were cutting coupons. It was a corporate job, but people were cutting coupons and they didn't have enough to do. And so... After about um, a month or so, my boss said, oh, now I've taught you everything that I need, that I know about this job. And so I taught, I took all my study time and I taught myself APL, which is a very old programming language that is extremely matrix oriented and perfect for actuaries. And so I taught myself APL. I programmed my job. So all you had to do, I, I did special rating for health projects. So when an employer wanted to change their deductible or their um, co-insurance co or something like that, you'd look up the Milliman health cost guidelines and say, okay, well, this is the adjustment factor. Yep. I programmed that so that somebody could do it. <laughs> so you took it out of the books and put it in. in like I a took it out of the books. I put it in and I, I made it so I was useless. That's so I, well, that's, well. There you go. <laughs> Got myself out of a job, which I then I left to go to Milliman because um, that okay. that's a consulting practice and it was much more interesting to do different things all the time. So you weren't doing all the same things over and over again. So that's cool. I didn't know um, that you had a little bit of a technical background with programming and things like that. I you know I I kind of have a similar background with programming. What do you think it's uh, how important do you think programming is for actuaries? Oh. I kind of had a discussion about this in my two <laughs> previous interviews, and I think it's very important. And like for me, you know, I minored in computer science, and that's coming yeah. almost more handy than my math. Although my math is coming handy for the exams, but in terms of like actually at work, so I'm curious what your thoughts are. On that. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's, I mean, it, that's how you get the job done. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can't, I mean, <clears throat> I taught myself Lotus. Okay. I'm aging myself again. That was, you know, when they first put a, uh, my, uh, a computer station on your desk. That was, I the, myself that was pre pre Excel for anyone. Pre Excel, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, and uh, so I had a I did a I learned taught myself programming then and back back then a little bit later on at when I was at Milliman I ran I created this I was working on a um, 
a demutualization project for a company. And we had to go through and determine what the value of the essentially the stock of the mutual company was for every single employer group. And so they had, this is years and years and years of mutualization and um, many, many, many employer groups. And so I created, and this is now Excel, I created a program that ran on a 286 machine, which is really wow. slow, <laughs> for 15 hours. Wow. So I'd have to set it to go, <laughs> go home, Come check on it day. in the middle of the night if I could, if I had it home with me, yeah. you know, and back then your laptops were as big as these sewing machine cases that you'd carry yep. around with you <laughs> and a <laughs> tiny little screen about this big. So it was pretty amazing. But yes, programming is is the the core of how you get your job done. What you learn on the exams is just is um, valuable to a certain extent. But yep. the, the on the job experience in the programming to get the answers that you need and then the translation translation is the most important part people forget yep. about that sometimes but it's it's core you got to know how to code yeah and i think you and i discussed very briefly when we were talking the other day about uh reasonability of of a number like you get yep. results from a program and uh, you know, it's it's important to have like that's a whole skill set in and of itself. Yeah. You know, number is reasonable, which kind of comes with experience. I think you know, right. in whatever industry that you're in, um, right. And data scientists that that background is going to be more and more important for actuaries to understand whether they do it themselves or they hire people to do it. Um, uh, really understanding um, information that where you use information that is not maybe numbers, but um, uh, translating information from a care management nurse's notes and so that you can search on that stuff yes. and find, you know, find what uh, your member has so then you can figure out what we need to do or how many members have this issue and you have to go through the case notes because I, diagnosis codes aren't enough Right. You know, the, that kind of information, the big data issues are going to be imp more and more important. And um, uh, we as actuaries have to be aware that there's it's a different approach. It's a totally different approach to working. And um, I was on the OK, here's a plug the American Academy of Actuaries. A big data working group, and we just published a paper on um, the actuarial issues related to big data. And oh, so, nice. if if people want to look on the American Academy of Actuaries website, which is actuary.org, yeah. look for big data. Um, they I can, can uh, I could even post the link below this to the. Oh, that'd be cool. Paper. Yeah. So yes. Anyone who's, who's listening, I'll post that after the interview. Okay. Um, so for those who haven't figured it out already, Audrey is in the health field as opposed to property casualty. Um, and so this question is kind of related to health, but you know, on the health side, you get your ASA and your FSA as opposed to the ACAS. And then I think it's, is it FCAS? FCAS, yeah. Um, so my question you for can you can also is, get an EA, don't forget. Uh, okay. Enrolled yep. actuary. And, and an EA, yep. And there's there's several different types of things that you can get. Um, I, I don't always remember all the letters, but C E R A. Um, yep. But my question is, did you feel like in your experience, I've asked a few people this uh, outside of these interviews, did you feel like it was harder to go from zero to ASA or ASA to FSA? Uh well, <clears throat> I would say um it's harder to go. Okay, we're you were talking to somebody from the last century. I got my FSA. Okay, I, I know. I know things have changed, and so <laughs> it will change over time. But yes, it right. will. <laughs> I think uh, personally, I think it might be more difficult now because they've broken it up into so many pieces. Um, but I like some of the the modules that they do. I think that's actually you have to actually show them work product. Yes, which I think is cool. Um, but back in the day, I failed every exam once, except for my last ASA and my last FSA. 
exam. Wow, nice. Okay. So it's okay to fail. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and I mean, everyone who's listening, she uh, is a chief actuary, been extreme. I'm, I'm just giving you props so that people know that yeah. like even she failed exams and she's been extremely successful. So I did. I did. And, um, but I finished the exams. I think having all the material for the first exams was really helpful for me in passing the first, uh, the ASA exams, because by the time I graduated from college, I had all the material through the old ASA exams where there was five of them. And so okay. I had it all. And then it was self-study. But in gotcha. the ones when I be, became a fellow, those exams were all self-study. And so, of course, I trained myself on self-study in college by not going to class and just going to the library all the time. Shh, don't tell anybody. All right, keep but, it in a secret. <laughs> <laughs> but if they did, if they took attendance, I went. But if they didn't take attendance, and I knew when the exams were, I would just show up for the exams. And I graduated with honors. See, you were one of those people. Yeah, I, I knew people like that in school, and I always was like, I was like, how did they? They, they did extremely well on the exams and they wouldn't come to class. And for me, I'm more of a learner where I like yeah. seeing, seeing it on the whiteboard, seeing the teacher walk through it. I, I was like, that helped me. But I knew people that, that didn't help them and they would do extremely well. And I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> well, it's a lot of the study because I wouldn't go to class because I would go and study. And yeah. I knew the material was in the book. Yep. And so, um, and that's where, you know, the, the self-study on the material now on the actuarial exams, you, you have to do it. And um, sometimes there are areas that have courses, like um, I was in Connecticut, so the University of Hartford had uh, courses for the upper exams that um, any actuarial student in a working could take. Oh, that's nice. And I, I tried one of those a couple times, and I found that I would just, it was a waste of my time. But yeah. that was just because the self-study was and good. I was going to say with the exams, I feel like it's way better to, I mean, you obviously have to learn the material, but for me, it, it, practicing problems, it was, yeah. uh, that's the biggest thing. So yeah. you, can't, you can't really do that in a class setting as much. Right. And you got to time yourself too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and flashcards. So did you like? Because now, nowadays, there's uh, you know various different companies that publish study material. Um, you know, the syllabus will reference here's the textbooks that it comes from, and then you can go order stuff from these other companies where, you know, you don't even need to look at those textbooks. Do you feel like, um, or not? Do you feel like? But back when you took the exams, did you have something like that, or was yes. it more you had to go just get those textbooks to to kind of buy the. By the FSA exams, yes, we I would get the material, Actex is one, and um, I think it was like the only one back then. And I had the books, and I had the Actex, and I would add in just minute, tiny little scribbles I would take from the book and put it into those notes from the Actex manual. Okay, and, yeah. then, and then I would take notes from my new revised Actex manual and make flashcards from it. So I would read the material and take notes because the writing part is what made it, made it um, me memorize things. The writing part, if I didn't write it down, it was harder to stick in my head. Yes. So I write it down. So I wrote it down about three times by the time I actually took the exam. Uh, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. I, I found that writing things helped me a lot too. I did something kind of similar to, to what you did. Um, okay, so to transition kind of from the exams, uh, you know, that was kind of in the early part of your career. You uh, went to Hartford. You, yep. you know, bounced around to a few different companies. When when uh, at what point in your career did you actually start kind of transitioning into managing or becoming a leader, uh, and how did um, how did your daily life change? Well, um, I guess I became a leader more so than a manager when I was at Milliman. I was at Milliman for 15 years and um, moved from becoming, you know, a, a, an actuarial consultant to a, um, a principal to an equity principal. So I actually had my own practice at the end of my my uh, working with at Milliman's. So 
Um, I think when I was one of the senior actuaries before I became a, um, a principal, but definitely by the time I became a principal, I had working, I had groups of people that I would work with. And so um, I was sort of a manager there, but it was more of managing of projects rather than managing people. And then yeah. when I became the vice president of actuarial um, at Primera Blue Cross, I ultimately became the chief actuary there after the chief actuary retired. Um, uh, there, we had a, an HR business partner who taught me the ways of HR because nobody ever taught me how what you needed to think about in organizational development or human resources. So it's really the organizational development side of it and um, getting people to think about their career and creating a career development plan and doing 360s and having people tell you what's wrong with you yep. and and really, you know, really getting insight from other people. Um, she really and and planning and and thinking and training and training on negotiation skills. I mean, we we actuaries are often doing involved in the negotiations. Um, think about risk sharing with providers, for example. You have to be on one end to sort of create the risk share arrangement, and that is really part of the negotiation because you have to come up with something, and then if they come back and even if you're not doing the negotiation, if somebody if the provider comes back and tells the contracting guy, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. You have to sort of figure out what what are the um, the pros and cons of each perspective, not just the health plan's perspective, but the provider's perspective. So if you're especially if you're working on the provider side, right? Oh, Actuaries can do that. So, um, so just thinking about the skills that my staff needed and planning ahead for that, she really taught me the ways of organizational development. And I thank her for that. She's still a good friend of mine. I brought her in at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona to work with my managers. And um, uh, so I, it was there that I really learned a better approach to management and thinking holistically about the staff and what their needs were rather than just projects. Yep. So. Oh, that's brought that with me. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So did you do you feel like uh, I mean, obviously, it was probably kind of a long transition in terms of you just yeah. started leading on projects and then eventually you started leading people. Do you right. feel like you're um, comparing kind of from when you first started and probably you were a lot more involved in like direct analyses? Do you feel like your life was any different? Like where what, what does your life look like now? I mean, you're not. You're not in a cubicle now. Are you in an office? Do you have like, do you have lunch breaks? I, I want, I want to know. Like, do you have, or are well, you stuck? <laughs> prior like, this, to, this will prior be good for people to hear. Like, what, yeah. what your life looks like. Do you have time to like go on a run if you want to go outside, or is it just kind of nonstop from the morning to the evening? <laughs> prior to, prior to my um, telling the company that I'm retiring, mm -hmm. I would have meetings often. Definitely from nine to five, back to back, including lunch, where they'd bring lunch in for you, or else it would be eight to six sometimes. And mm -hmm. so the only time I had to do my work, which as chief actuary, I have work to do too, yeah, yeah. was at five in the morning. This is exactly what Brian told me too. This is why I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you wish for yeah, when you exactly. become a manager. And and we actually had um, with my HR business partner who helped us at um, at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. We actually had two managers who chose to become individual contributors because they really didn't want to have to do what they needed to do to yeah. become a, a strong manager and grow. That way, they wanted to do the work, yeah. and that's okay. You don't need to be a manager. You can do the work as an individual contributor, and there's more and more of those, those opportunities, especially in consulting. Pretty much that is that is what you do. Um, and that's that's kind of why I asked you the question, because I want to help people who are watching that may be thinking of going either route, just kind of get to get a feel, because I think some people are going to enjoy just doing the, the analyses more and being right. in that. And I think some people are going to enjoy the leadership more. And I think it's going to right. depend on, you know, a personality and the type of person they are. 
Right. And, and leaders is still, you can be very technical. I, I've known some leaders, I had an argument with a chief information officer once at uh, Primera who said that um, uh, in order to manage, you didn't need to know how to do the work. <laughs> and I said, mm, I disagree. I would disagree with that. <laughs> So, I, I've seen I've seen some managers that have not known how to do work and it doesn't work well. Right, and and so if you can, uh, the the key leadership capability, one of them is to to get the staff people that you're working with to think creatively, and you don't want to tell them how to do something, but sometimes you have to, but sometimes you don't. But get them to think, well, how do you do this, and then then say, well, why don't you think about it and then come back and let's talk about it. And then that way you're helping them think through a solution um, while without, but also helping them think. It's the yeah. thinking that the leaders are training the staff to do. And it's technical. I did a lot, a lot of work myself too, even as chief actuary. I believe in, that. In both places, in yeah. both places, because I needed to keep my hands dirty. And you kind of so, have to understand a lot of different aspects because you have actuaries right. working on a million different projects. Right. You have to kind of understand what's going on in everything. So. Right. And I had at, at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona, I had actuarial services. I had um, healthcare economics, which is sort of the provider analytics for contracting. I had the data governance. I had risk adjustment. So I had I had four different things I was responsible for. Yes. And so I, I, my meetings would just pop from one topic to another and you have to be agile and I, enough to be ready for it. As soon as you walk out of one meeting, you walk into another and you have to be on and you have to have it in your head. And so at that part of manager role is hard when you're managing all these different things, but you got to know enough about every topic you don't need to know the grain, the grains of sand, but you need to know enough so that you can be coherent and add value in the discussions that you have with other executives. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. I mean, because like not only are you managing the actuaries, but you're dealing with people across the company. So yep, um, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was also curious, uh, what advice do you have for anyone who may not even be an actuary, but they've already started their career and they've worked with actuaries or they've heard of it um, and they're interested in totally switching careers? Uh, do you have advice for uh, that type of person and what they should do to get into it? Um, well, I know a, a number of people who have done that and um, they've been pretty successful. Um, they need to understand that it's a big commitment with the study time. Yes. Um, I think uh, I, I watched um, the last one that you did and, and he was saying you need about 100 study hours per hour of exam. And, and I agree with that, although I never quite made it that much. <laughs> but Well, then you take it again and you add up those hours. That's right. That's right. In that respect, I did twice as much then. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's a big commitment. And um, in, if you can take one of the first exams, it used to be that calculus was the first exam. I don't even know if that's still the first exam or not. It's not. It's, uh, well, there's two that you take as the first one, probability or financial math. Uh, but the okay. probability one is very heavy calc based. So it, it assumes a knowledge of calculus. Right. So it's kind of got a lot of calc in there. Right. So if you, if you have that and you have, if you, you understand that and remember it because there was after, um, back in 2009, I decided to go for the CERA exam and they had this advanced finance uh, exam I had to take and I had to go buy another calculus book. So <laughs> if you need to go buy another calculus book, maybe you should take a class. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but if you've got calculus under the belt and you want to take the first exam or the financial math um, one, take that t and see see if you if you pass. Yep. And so just just try it and um, and then if you have an exam that you've passed on your own and then you can you can actually make the eyes of somebody who's hiring 
if you're just saying that you have an interest in it, but you've never, you didn't go through an actuarial program or something like that, it might be hard to do. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I mean, I would say in my experience, I'm not nearly as experienced as Audrey, but um, when, you know, when I first started, that's kind of how I got in was by, uh, well, my brother-in-law actually worked with an actuary. He got me in touch with him and we talked for a while. And then he, I didn't pass any, I hadn't passed any exams at that point. And then he's like, well, go take the first exam. And if you pass, get back to me. So that, <laughs> that motivated me. <laughs> and then, uh, I ended up passing, getting in touch with him, you know, and through a series of, of that type of thing, I got my job. And then of course I took a more cool. technical route for a while and then got back into actuarial when I went back to blue cross. So there you go. But yeah. Okay. So that's, I think that's good advice. I okay. also, I have another uh, question for you uh, on your thoughts. We kind of touched on this earlier, but um, you know, with where technology is going um, and you know, actuarial being so involved in technology because it's very based in data, uh, yeah. do you think in the next 20, 30 years, uh, our jobs are gonna look different? Um, what are your, your kind of thoughts on that? Well, I don't have to worry about it, do I? No, nope, you don't. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> I know. I th I think yes, it is going to be. It, it is going to look different. Um, uh, the there's politics is going to always be an interesting change motivator on on how we do things and and how insurance is provided across all of the. Um, the practices, not just health, um, but with the the computing power and the capabilities that we're just starting to get into, um, it's going. It, it'll be people will look back at us and say, "Wow, that was really old. That was so God. I can't believe you got what it, you know." We look. I look back at what I started with, which was those green sheets of paper with the little red dots on all the handwritten numbers. Yeah, that's how I started. That's what I was doing in my first internship. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? What, what's the uh, what's the law where they say technology doubles every so many years? Is it is that Murphy's law or is that? <laughs> what, I don't I don't remember what the law is. But. I don't want, know what the law is, but it, <laughs> but people are going to look back and say, I can't believe that you were able to do your job back then. Yeah, and um and there's going to be lots of of continued capability that vendors create. And I think from an actuarial professionalism perspective, actuaries are going to be, have to be very careful about um, just relying on black boxes. And yeah. so we're going to have to know how things work, why, why the results look the way they do. And with artificial intelligence and um, results that can change because one more little tiny bit of information shows up, um, we're going to have to deal with that right now. I really like the fact that, you know, if you have the same set of information, you just do the same calculations, you're going to get the same results. Yes. But with artificial intelligence that learns along the way, you may get different results in the future. And so how do you deal with that? That is going to be an issue that we have to work with. That's see, I, that's why I wanted to ask you. I think that's interesting. I was kind of thinking about it too. And I think that in the future, a lot more things that we do now will be automated. But having said that, like you're saying with the black box, I think the value in an actuary or where we provide value is by interpreting those results because um, it's not always going to be the same in every situation and there's going to be business needs or things that you have to interpret that you understand that maybe um, your program didn't. So I think that I, that's that's what I would have said too. Our roles will probably change because a lot of the things I think of that I do now, I'm like, well, a lot of this could be potentially automated, but there's also <laughs> stuff that I do that really maybe couldn't be. So um, yeah, and maybe more time will be spent on those types of things. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it will. I mean, look look at my first job experience. I I got myself out of a job because I programmed everything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Exactly. It. So, and then I know we're we're getting close close to an hour here, so we'll wrap up soon. I just have a couple more thoughts and questions. Um, okay. One one I wanted to ask you, and in, in uh, kind of thinking about an actuarial career, there's 
you know, there's the health side, which is really what you dove into. Yeah. Property casualty, you know, there's retirement. Um, there's all sorts of different places that actuaries can go. I know you said you kind of touched on workers comp for a little bit in your career. How, yeah. how would uh, you help someone kind of decide what to get into? Do you think it really matters or do you think that there's one that someone might particularly enjoy over another? Oh, I, I do actually. Um, I like, I like the health because there's, it's a short period of time, usually just a year. Yes. Um, but lo there's long-term care, which is, obviously long term there's life insurance which is long term there's annuities which is long term which is ties into pensions um and casualty oftentimes is even longer you know yeah. um so uh the it was interesting the advanced finance exam that i didn't take what to take the cera exam um it the reason i didn't take it because it took me 300 hours just to get through the material once wow and it was a three hour exam. So unreal. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it, it, I was dated. OK, so it, I, I had to go buy a calculus book, like I said. Um, but I realized that um, that the the math required for the long term um, insurance is much more complicated and much more technical than it is for health insurers because we're only dealing with a year or maybe two or five if we want to do financial projections. So um, uh, if you're really a math head and, and just love the, the, the theoretical distribution and work like that, then I would consider either casualty, life insurance, um, uh, uh, pension plans, those kinds of things because yeah. It's more, it's way more complicated. But if you like the business side of it, um, well, all of it has business, right? But if you yeah. like the business side of it and you like the, there's right now with the ACA, the Affordable Care Act and things like that, that are changing healthcare so drastically. I mean, the, the Association Health Plan regulation just came out yesterday. <laughs> so now I got to read that to yep. see how that's going to affect our insurance the next year, yep. which is part of the, I love policy work. Um, uh, health insurance is a great place for that. So it just sort of depends on on the the level of technical work that you like, as well as um, if you're interested in health insurance. I've always been interested in the medical field. Yep. I worked with doctors for a while at, at, uh, at Milliman. I even went and watched an open heart surgery in the operating room. Did you really? Wow. Yeah, and I, I, I was able to stand there for a whole half an hour before I started feeling sick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would, yeah, I struggle in hospitals. Yeah, <laughs> but the, you know, so if you're, if you're passionate about um, black lung disease or something like that, that's one of the casualty things. If you're, if you're passionate about, um, about the the planet and and um, the environment changing, maybe casualty also is something you should think about. If you're passionate about health care, health insurance is a great way to use your your capabilities and actually have an opportunity to affect people in health care. So then you should be in maybe in health insurance. But you know, um, so yeah, it's I like this because sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. That's okay. You go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I like this because I've, I've, I like hearing your perspective on that. It does matter because I've heard a lot of people say, oh, just go the route where you get your first job and it won't really matter. But I, I really agree with what you're saying because yeah. I, I do think there is a big difference between the two. And, and for those of you who, who are watching um, or may not know that like with health insurance, what she was saying is short term because you know, if you're looking at a year of data, that's your most recent year of data. And that's going to be more in terms of probability, more likely to represent your next year or next couple years of data than if you looked, you know, previous years and years back because your population changes, um, you know, health conditions change, things like that. Whereas property casualty, you might be looking at the 1% probability that a hurricane is going to hit. And that might only happen every five years or every 10 years or whatever the case may be. So, uh, that's where the math and that gets really complicated because you're trying to figure out how much money you got to reserve for these low probability scenarios. Whereas with health, you have a high probability scenario that's more consistent. So that's 
just to expound expand on what you were saying. But yeah, and, I think that's interesting. Yeah, and one other one other thing, health insurance, you're only doing the rates for one year. Mm -hmm. so you're doing the projection, maybe it's two years ahead because you have to set them so far in advance, but you're only doing the reserves to cover one year of experience where in life insurance, you're covering somebody until they die. Right. And so it, it, it maybe it's only one year term or five year term or until age 65 or whole life, you know, but it's so it can be extremely long um, period of time that you're trying to rate for. And so that also that projecting into the future is is a much more complicated than just projecting premium rates for one year of coverage. That's a very good point. And a yeah. lot's going to happen over maybe 60 years, 30, 60 right. years or whatever the case may be. So Right. Right. And then in life insurance, when they give you as a as the um, uh, insured the opportunity to to put your money in different investments and change it around and take loans out and stuff like that, that yeah. just <laughs> really complicates things. Then you don't have to worry about it. it used to be back in the day, last century, you know, you, you assume a 4% interest rate on your investments and your assets because the company would invest it. But here now they let people choose their investments. So what kind of changing are they going to do? Are they going to never change it? Are they going to change it every day? Are they going to take a loan out next year and then pay it back? What are they going to do? So all of that stuff has to be determined when you're setting the rates for life insurance. Yep. Very complicated. And it's that's the fun of what used to be called MLC now the LTAM exam <laughs> <laughs> that, that exam was so uh, yeah that was a tough one <laughs> I have my father's life contingencies book you really yes. yeah has, has it changed much much since then it, yes. <laughs> yes the basics ha have not but in in fact I have my own that I had in college back in the last century too. Um, but it's just, it's amazing to see that some of it is very much the same because the, the yeah. theory is the same underlying it, but um, how they apply it and all of those additional things to consider, like we were talking about options, is um, takes it into a totally different place. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, well, I think uh, since we're getting close to the hour here, I will ask you two more uh, totally different type of questions just for okay. fun. Uh, I like to do this at the end of the interviews is, what is your favorite restaurant that you've been to in the past year? Totally unactuarial. El Gaucho's in Seattle. It's, oh, a steak nice. it's a steak place where it's just incredible, incredible steak. And then they serve you fruit and cheese for free for as part of the dessert. But if you want to get dessert, you can too. I mean, but it's just yeah. incredible. It's just a little dark, but great food. That's awesome. I, I love, I love steak. So I'll have to try that. One out in Seattle. <laughs> you should. Um, and then my other question for you is what is your favorite hobby? Oh, I, that is really hard to speak to, uh, but I, I guess my, my favorite one is downhill skiing, winter sports, because my goal in life is to be skiing by the time I'm 80. That That's is my awesome. goal. That, so, that sounds like my uncle. My uncle is big into skiing and yeah. he, uh, like, I, I swear he's going to ski till the day he dies. He's, I mean, it's impressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it'll keep you in good shape too. Yeah, yeah, and and um, I, I've only been able to go about f three or four or five times a year since I um, took that job in Arizona. But now that I'm retiring, I'll be right up here in my seasons pass at Mount that Baker. That is the way to do it. Yeah, Audrey and I were talking a little before the interview, and I was saying that's one thing I miss about you know I lived in Arizona, now I'm in California, and it's like it's not quite the same as Northwest skiing. Like it is just. It's awesome up there. Yeah, it is. So, I'm yeah. I that that is one thing I do enjoy a lot of this <laughs> this team, and I, I miss it. So, yeah. although sailing is this time of year is sailing, and and um, we have a nice uh, Harbor 20, 20 foot sailboat with a uh, 
a 900 pound weighted keel sitting at the end of the dock. And that is oh, awesome. it is fun to just go out on the lake and go sailing. Very cool. All right. Well, I think, uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, thanks again for joining. That was, I, I feel like I could talk to you. I have like so many things I could ask you, but, um, <laughs> well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed talking to you. I hope everyone listening enjoyed that. And if you have any comments, like I said, you can post them afterwards. I didn't see any during the live, uh, video, but we can go ahead and answer those and I'll post the, it was, what was the paper? It was the big data. Uh, big American. data through, uh, yeah, at the American Academy of Actuaries. Yeah, I'll, I'll post that in the link below. Okay. So. Thanks again, Audrey. It was really All good right. to see you. Good to talk to you. And yeah, you too. I'll talk to you later. And I'm out from California. Audrey's out from Washington. Thanks. Bye. Bye.